Here, here on the Annunciation Radio family of stations, WNOC 89.7 in the Greater Toledo area, WHRQ 88.1 in the Sandusky area, 89.5 WFOT in Mansfield, 90.9 WSHB in Willard, 89.9 WRRO in Bryan, and our newest affiliate out in Fostoria, 104.1 WLBJ. Uh, folks, there's a couple other great stations in Northwest Ohio that carry the Bishop's Corner, 88.9 WJTA in Lipsick and 103.3 WSJG in Tiffin. Uh, the Bishop's Corner is heard every Thursday night and it's rebroadcast several times throughout each weekend. You can check that broadcast schedule at the Annunciation Radio website, which is www.annunciationradio.com. And Bishop, I, we also welcome our viewers back because we had technical difficulties. We're sorry for, the, for that hiatus, but we're grateful to be back yeah. on video and, of course, on radio as always. So we thank you all for tuning in, and we have a ton of questions to get to. We do, Ron. And we're never going to get close to getting to them all. But um, before we do that and the gospel, anything on your mind? Sure. Well, the first, I think, we've entered into the month of November. Yeah. And so for all our good folks, it's the month that we traditionally call the month of the Holy Souls. And I think for us, remembering all our faithful departed uh, is, is both a, it's a prayerful act that assists them, please God, who are in purgatory. And it's also an act of the family, because we believe that the communion of saints, the communion of those in purgatory, and the communion of the living mm. are, if you will, what we technically call the church triumphant, the church suffering, sure. and the church militant. Sure. So I just have a quick story, Ron, about my uh, great aunt. And people might be interested to know that I have a great aunt, Anna, and she lives still in Philadelphia. She's in a nursing home now. She will celebrate her 104th birthday soon. Oh my gosh. And of course, someone of that age, you know, has fundamentally lost everyone in their life. Sure. And we were speaking about death the last time I was with her, and she said, honey, she said, you've loved me during my life. And I said, of course, Aunt Anna. And she said, well, make sure that when I die, you love me into heaven. Hmm. <laughs> and isn't that a beautiful yeah. phrase? Because for those of us who have lost loved ones, we love them so much that our bonds don't end, but we also want to ask the Lord to forgive them their sins, to allow them to be washed clean of any residue of their yeah. sins if they are in purgatory, and then to gain heaven. So I thought it was a beautiful phrase from Aunt Anna, love me into heaven. So yes. I think in November, that's mm. folks what we do. We love our deceased relatives and friends, please God, into heaven by our prayers, masses, and good works. Yes, good. Anything else on your mind? Before sure. We... One thing I certainly want to remind folks of, and I don't want the Jubilee year to end, Ron, without yes. our folks being reminded of that. Folks, if you haven't been to one of the holy doors and gone through a holy door to receive the indulgence, I really invite you to make a pilgrimage before the year ends. And I just want to remind folks and invite them and encourage them to come to that mass which will close mm. the Jubilee year of mercy which is Saturday evening, the 19th of November, at the 5 p.m. Mass at our cathedral, Rosary Cathedral, which of course is the Feast of Christ the King. So I would love to have a packed cathedral yeah. to close the Jubilee Year of Mercy here in the Diocese of Toledo. And then of course the very next day, Sunday, our Holy Father Pope Francis will close the door at the Vatican at St. Peter's. All right, good. All right. Thank well, you. Before we get to our gospel, we have a question, and I'd, I'd like you to have just in general comment about the election, the recent election. But we have sure. a question that kind of relates to that. Maybe we'll get that in first before our gospel here. It says, from Sam in the White House, dear Bishop, with the political upheaval of the uh, election and threats to freedom of religion and so on, I'm wondering if the Catholic Church will lose its tax-exempt status. If it does, what do you feel the outcome would be? I realize this would be uh, simply conjecture, but can you offer any opinions on the subject? Thank you. I appreciate your very clear teaching on the moral issues facing us in the upcoming or the current or just past presidential election. Thanks, Sam. Thank you, Sam, so much. And I, you know, I often hear people say, "Oh, well, you know, this these things will never happen." And of course, people talk about you, you know you could have never imagined euthanasia happening, but it happened. They could have imagined abortion being legalized, but it happened. They could never have imagined same-sex unions being recognized by the government as marriage, but it happened. Mm. So I, I think, Sam, we have to be worried that the church may lose its tax-exempt status if, in fact, there are powers that be that continue to force these issues against not only the Catholic Church, but all people who are, hold deep beliefs 
and the government desires to remove our religious liberty. Because remember, we're guaranteed by the Constitution, we're guaranteed the right to not just worship, but the right to freedom of religion. And we hear over and over again politicians, including the president, referring to, well, you have the right to worship, but that's not what the Constitution guarantees us. It guarantees us, really, something much more than just worship in a house of God. It guarantees us freedom of religion. So I don't think we're far away, Ron, from the possibility now that, for example, our priests and deacons, who are recognized by the state as legitimate representatives to witness a marriage and then let that be legitimized by the state, it may very well come to the fact that they will not permit it since, of course, the church will not celebrate the mm. union of persons of the same sex. So something like this might be coming, and I can tell Sam the lawsuits are already lined up and in process where there are folks trying to take away our exempt status and undo our religious liberty. So mm. we do need to be worried, Sam, and we do need to focus our attention on justice for all people of goodwill so that we might live out our religious beliefs with the freedom guaranteed to us by the Constitution. Great. Thanks, Sam, for that question. And we're going to head to our Gospel, Bishop. Thank you. Um, recent Gospel from Luke. Some Sadducees, those who deny that there is a resurrection, came forward and put this question to Jesus, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us, if someone's brother dies, leaving a wife but no child, his brother must take the wife and raise up descendants for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first married a woman but died childless. Then the second and the third married her, and likewise all the seven died, died childless. Finally, the woman also died. Now at the resurrection, whose wife will that woman be? For all seven had been married to her. Jesus said to them, The children of this age marry and remarry, but those who are deemed worthy to attain to the coming age and to the resurrection of the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. They can no longer die, for they are like angels, and they are the children of God, because they are the ones who will rise. That the dead will rise, even Moses made known in the passage about the bush when he called out, Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And he is not God of the dead, but of the living, for to him all are alive. First thoughts, Bishop. I think it's important, Ron, for us to put this in context, just as the next couple of Sundays yeah. will give us Gospels in this last few weeks of ordinary time, where always, folks, the church presents to us if you will, a reflection on the end things. Mm -hmm. And so it also presents us a reflection on death and, of course, what happens to us when we die. So the Lord here is reminding people, obviously, they're asking a question. They want to trip the Lord up. They want to find him in a mistake and an error and be able to condemn him. But instead, as he always does, very cleverly and very uniquely, Jesus rises right above it and says, people marry and are given marriage on earth, but once, of course, we die, there is no marriage because we're in perfect bliss with the Lord. So in the end, he's encouraging people to live in such a way that they get to heaven because it's there that the Lord desires us to live with him for all eternity. So what happens to us here on earth and even the sacraments, there'll be no need for the sacraments yeah. in heaven because we'll be living in the perfect, extraordinary, please God, <laughs> presence of the Lord. So there will be no sacraments because they are the human reality of what Jesus left to us in the church in order for us to get there. All right, good. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Uh, thanks for that reflection. Bishop, we're going to sneak in one more question here before uh, our break. And this is from uh, Richard in Tiffin, Ohio. It says, Dear Bishop Thomas, is it proper for the U.S. government to hold blessed Catholic church bells as trophies of war? Specifically, the, now you're going to have to help me, Balangiga, what is I it? Think, I, I think yeah. if you pronounce it Balangiga, but Balangiga? Some, someone could correct me on that. Okay, Balangiga Bells. If not, will you support efforts to return them? Thank you for consideration. God bless you. And that's from Richard. Thanks, Richard. Thank you, Richard. I have to confess to you that my first response is when I read your email, uh, which was immediately, Richard, followed up by a, a letter with a lot of documentation that you sent me, which in fact arrived in my office the very same day as your email for the Bishop's Corner, I must confess to you and, and to Ron and to our listeners, I had no idea what the Balangigo bells were and no knowledge of the issue or of the controversy. As a result, I had to go and inform myself to find out just what are these bells, just what is the case. 
So uh, to your question in particular, of course, if there is property that was owned by someone and someone else is holding it or has taken it illegally, that's a legal issue. The reality, of course, Richard, that people might take something that is blessed, it has nothing to do with the fact that something is blessed, but it has to do with someone has taken something which is, in effect, not their own. So someone can steal someone else's rosary, the rosary is blessed, but what's wrong about it is not that the article is blessed, what's wrong about it is that they've stolen it. And I have to be very frank with you, Richard, I, it's very hard for me, as the bishop of a diocese, you can understand, while I appreciate deeply that you have deeply, uh, deeply felt conviction about these bells, and it's clear to me, this has gone on for over a century, that as a result in 1901, I believe it is, of, of the American-Philippine War, that this bell was taken. I must confess to you that for me, while I understand the energy you want to put into this, and I, I'm sure it is, it is placed with great intention, hope you understand that my energy has to be to caring for the flock that's given to me and also to offer pastoral care to people. So while I understand your dilemma, I, I certainly can't enter into it because I know so little about it, and I would humbly suggest that if in fact these bells are still held by the U.S. government, it is up to, to you and other folks to petition against it. Because it's clear to me also, I found on the internet a petition to President Barack Obama signed by many people. So it's clear to me there's an awful lot of things that have been done over time in this regard. And I would suggest if the government is holding something stolen and unjustly taken, then it could be directed toward the government. All right, great. Thanks, Richard. Thank we, you, Ron. We appreciate people's passion about anything. Like and that, and so. obviously passionate about that issue. Absolutely. Folks, we have to take just a quick break. Don't go anywhere. You'll be right back here at the uh, Bishop's Corner listening to uh, Bishop Thomas answer your questions. Stay right where you're at. Thomas, uh, folks, the bishop's always anxious to get your questions. Uh, uh, we sometimes have a lot too many to get through, but we'll do our best. But there are several ways you can get them to us. Uh, you can just Google the Bishop's Corner, or you can go to <laughs> AnnunciationRadio.com. If you click on the Bishop's Corner, a little template will pop up, and you can put your question right in there. Uh, as I mentioned, we do our very best to get to all of them. Sometimes we have a few too many. but We have an awful lot we're gonna, this, we're gonna <laughs> for We're going to move right show. through them here, Bishop. Thank you, Ron. We're going to go to Bob uh, from St. Patrick and Brian. It says, Dear Bishop, with November comes your annual bishops meeting, which I believe is in Baltimore. Do you receive agendas, etc., beforehand with topics to be discussed when you arrive? Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Bob. I know we got this question last year for the Bishop's Corner, Ron, at the very yeah, same I think time. We did. Yeah. And I think it's simply a, a, a sign, and thank you, Bob, that people are interested to know what the bishops are doing and how they're gathering. Oftentimes, that agenda is made public, the, the parts of it that are public. And of course, we'll be meeting again in mid-November. I'll go to that meeting together with all the other bishops of the United States. Of course, it's United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, and we meet yearly in November, mostly to discuss pastoral issues that are facing the church, and therefore assist one another with efforts to care for the flock in the United States. One of the issues, I think, Ron, that will be certainly followed carefully, and Bob, you probably know that there are elections that take place every so often for new officers of the conference. And this year, the, the president and vice president, their terms run out. Oh. And so this is an election year. And I'm sure that, of course, is on the agenda. And that will get a tremendous amount of attention. So that the president, who is Archbishop Joseph Kurtz of Louisville, and the vice president, who is Cardinal Daniel DiNardo of Galveston, Houston, there will be a whole new slate of 10 people and we'll first vote for a new president, and in that slate of 10, Cardinal DiNardo's name will appear, and then all after he's elected, then we'll elect a vice president based on the other list. Who picks the slate of 10? How does that happen? This, and that's a very good question, Ron. The slate of 10 is actually formed from each bishop being asked to present five candidates. Hmm. So every bishop uh, is in the United States is asked to present five. They present those, those are tabulated, and the top uh, number who receive the highest number of votes okay. basically go on to the ballot. Okay, good. Yeah. Very good. All so right. thank you, Bob. Do you like uh, socialize at all? Do you get any time to in talk in to each other? In between the endless meetings. Is that right? <laughs> they never end? But I would just ask Bob and all our listeners, 
to pray for the bishops during those meetings because obviously we're, we're called to make different decisions that uh, impact the governance of the church and the pastoral care of the people. So please remember us during those days and especially remember us by praying for grace that we would elect the representatives that the Holy Spirit desires yeah. at this time for our Episcopal Conference in the U.S. Great. Thanks, Bob. Thank and you. And we're going to go to uh, Miriam in Perrysburg, who says, Dear Bishop Thomas, my Protestant co-worker is trying to convert me. <laughs> she got a little exclamation point after that. <laughs> she comes up with all kinds of reasons why her church is right and mine is wrong. Uh, the latest discussion was about church teaching outside of the Bible. She says that church documents were added to Scripture and used to sell us a bill of goods. Can you give me a good defense I can use to explain how the church's teaching authority is undisputable? I'm trying to keep up a friendly relationship her, with her, but it's getting difficult. Thanks, Miriam. Well, Miriam, first of all, God love you, and thank you for writing in. And I know that your situation, Miriam, is a situation, I'm sure, Ron, all the time. that many of our listeners and viewers encounter. Sure. So I know I say this all the time, and some of you probably are tired of hearing me say it, but I think it's important to say the very first approach is charity. The second approach is charity, and the third approach is charity. Because obviously, as my dear mom used to say, you're not going to win anybody by giving them cod liver oil. You're going to, you're yeah. going to win them by giving them honey. So I think the very first thing is witnessing to your Catholic faith in a very charitable, loving, kind way, but also, in a sense, being firm so as to say, I believe what I believe deeply. I have deep-seated convictions. And I am not interested in converting, but let me tell you why that is. And then I would say maybe with the help of a priest or someone else who you know very, very well, because I don't know the specific issues, Miriam, that she might uh, get to. We know the classic issues are papal authority and slash infallibility, the reality of the Holy Eucharist, that bread and wine can become the body and blood, and Our Lady. So those are the three issues that folks always go to. But the one that you mentioned I'll just touch on, and that is, ask her, Miriam, where she thinks the Bible came from. <laughs> That's the first question. Because the Bible came from the church, that is the Catholic Church, putting into one what is called the canon of Scripture, that is, choosing those books which were judged to be authentic and inspired by the Holy Spirit, leaving aside those which were considered not authentic, and so it was the church herself, founded by Christ on the rock of Peter, his successor is the Holy Father, that defined the canon of scripture. So I would ask the first question, I think that's always a good yeah, first so salvo, Ron. Well, yeah. where do you think the Bible came from in the first place? I'd start there, Miriam, and I would, go, I would start with charity, with information, and with, with love. Yeah, and that's great advice. And the other thing I think on the, uh, what she brings up about uh, uh, the church's teaching is remember that scripture was not in any form in a printed form that, that the masses had access to until the printing press was invented. That's precisely right. Which was right. the, what, 1400? Precisely right. Something, and so until then, everything was being passed down pretty much through tradition. And, and it was all by tradition. Yes, so all of it. That's why, Miriam, you know, when they say scripture alone, and many Protestants will say right. that, the reality is we say, no, we have a twofold uh, track, if you will, or a parallel track. That is scripture and tradition, and neither of them can be separated from each other. Yeah, good, good, good question, Thank Miriam. you, Miriam. Good luck to you. And we're going to go to Greg, uh, who says he's listening on 89.9 WRRO, and he says, Dear Bishop, at the Mass, when the priest offers the bread and wine, we say, Blessed be God forever. I've often wondered about how we can bless God. We pray that God blesses us, so why do we say this at Mass? Thanks, Greg. Good, yeah. Greg. Thank you. How can you. we bless God? So we don't, we can't, and in fact, Greg, we're not blessing God. So I think it's really important there, Greg, to recognize we are not blessing God. As you well say, we don't have the capacity to do that. When we say the words, blessed be God forever, it means you are blessed, you are holy, you are great. And we say, for example, Hosanna in the highest, holy are you, blessed are you. When we say blessed are you, we're not giving our blessing to God, but we're recognizing that he, in fact, is blessed. So I think it's just a, might sound like a semantic sure. argument, right. but it's really not at all because yeah. we use this terminology. And Greg, we should know that it comes, you know, from these, these prayers over the gifts, come directly from the Hebrew prayers of Passover, over the bread and wine, which Jesus himself would have used. Mm. 
And those words, when we say the word blessed, the Hebraic prayers are expressing thanks and praise to God. So when the priest says, blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, through your goodness, you have given us this wine to offer. We're not blessing God. We're praising him and thanking him. And acknowledging that he And acknowledging blessed. his blessedness. Right. That's right. exactly right. right. So Greg, I, I hope that's helpful. There's really no contradiction at all, and we are not blessing God. Good. All right. Great. Thanks, Greg. Uh, we're going to go to Suzanne in Toledo. Dear Bishop Thomas, I have a question about confession. Someone told me that after receiving the sacrament of confession, we must wait until after we have finished the assigned penance before receiving Holy Communion. Is this true? If the penance is something that is completed over time, must we be denied the Eucharist in the time it takes to fulfill the penance? Thanks, Suzanne. That's an interesting question. Thank you, Suzanne, for that very thoughtful question about penance. The, the simple response is that there is nothing in the canon law or the liturgical law of the church that the penance must be fulfilled prior to the reception of Holy Communion. And that's for a very practical reason, because we know that Oftentimes, a person goes to confession, and then immediately there is a Mass. So there is nothing that says that must be concluded, because while you have to fulfill your penance, it is also true that at the moment of absolution, you are forgiven your sins. So we're expected to fulfill the penance that's given to us, but we are also forgiven of all our sins when the priest announces the absolution. Now, the other key here, and I think it's important to say, Ron, is that Suzanne, for example, we're taught in the seminary and in our classes on penance theologically and in our practicums that a priest does not give a penance that has to be fulfilled over long periods of time. We're actually taught that that's inappropriate. So normally, a penance should be able to be fulfilled in a very brief period of time. Now, in the case of some uh, for example, someone steals something and the priest says, well, your penance is return it to that person. That might take a day or two. Or to make retribution for it, that may take a day or two. But you have to be careful. It is not dependent upon whether or not you can receive Holy Communion. Okay. Thank good. you. Good. Very good, Suzanne. Thank you. I'm going to give you one, but you only have about a minute and a half. Oh, my tough people. Philip Here we from, go. Philip from Napoleon. Dear Bishop Thomas, why are some priests sent to Rome for more studies while others are not? <laughs> Does the bishop decide or does the priest request a particular assignment that requires an advanced degree? Thanks, Philip. Philip, thank you. The simple answer to that is that during the seminary time, and even before they go to seminary, the bishop, together with his vocations director, the vicar for clergy, and together with the vocations board, which is a board of folks who examine potential candidates, they might see in that candidate a certain giftedness. Perhaps uh, that giftedness is uh, intellectual giftedness in a particular subject and maybe as they go through the seminary it's very clear that they have extraordinary intellectual gifts and maybe even linguistic gifts mm. and so sometimes that's both recognized discussed and then the student might be asked would you be willing to go to Rome to study theology for example or to, d to do graduate studies after their priesthood after their ordination. So there are a number of people involved. Of course, you know, you ask, well, why are some chosen and others are not? Well, that's like asking, well, why is one person chosen to be the pitcher and another not? Yeah. So it, it, the, the bottom line here is that it's the, the gifts and charisms that they have that are recognized and then discerned to be able to put to the best use of the church. All right, great. Thanks, Philip. And we're out of time, Bishop, as always. How does this happen, Ron? <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't get in as many as we wanted, so keep listening, folks. You'll, uh, you'll hear the questions as we go along. Um, could we get a uh, blessing? Surely. A Let's a offer blessing? a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, in this month of November, grant us the grace of remembering our beloved deceased. Grant mercy and refreshment and cleansing of any residue of sin to all our faithful departed, and in particular to all of those who are our loved ones and all of those who have no one to pray for them. May they be received by you into the heavenly realm, cleansed from all their sin, and live with you forever in glory. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you the Father, and the Son, 
and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You got 10 seconds. Anything you want to say? I want to ask the people to pray for our beloved dead and love them into heaven, like my Aunt Anna said. Great. That was seven seconds. That was perfect. God bless you, everyone. Thank you for <laughs> listening and watching. Folks, turn in again next week because uh, we're here every time. Keep sending your questions. Absolutely. We'll keep answering. We'll see you again right here next week at the Bishop's Corner. <laughs>